and welcome to this another edition of the Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs, and I'm so thankful to be with you, and so glad we have this opportunity to once again open up God's Word and to study together. We encourage you, if you will, to get a Bible out and follow along with the things we're going to study as we spend time together in the Book of God. What I'd like for us to talk about is a, is a sermon that I've simply entitled, Christ in the Home. And I think it's so important that we have Christ in our homes today. I believe he has been pushed out of too many homes, and he is ignored in a lot of homes. And that's just a, a, a travesty. And it's a terrible situation that, that, that happens because if we push Christ out, if we keep him out of our homes and we keep him out of our lives, then the end result's going to be ultimately be being lost in hell. But before that, there's going to be sorrow, sadness, regrets. There's going to be so many things that, that make our lives just, just horrible. And so much of the time, we look around today and we see people who have pushed Christ away. We need to have Christ in our homes. I want to suggest to you that really when you think about the home and we think about the family, the home is under attack. It really is. The home is under attack today, and it has been since almost since the beginning. If you think about it, when God created the world, and he created Adam and Eve, created man and woman, Genesis chapter 2, and there from verse 18 to verse 25 speaks about the man, speaks about the woman, about her creation, about her being brought to the man, that he uh, would say this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she's taken out of a man. And how that, that uh, the woman would, would leave father and mother, and uh, rather the, the man would leave father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they too should be one flesh. The, the beauty of this picture, the beauty of this relationship, the beauty of this unity is there described for us in the book of, book of Genesis in chapter 2. And it is in chapter 3 then that Satan begins his work in trying to divide and conquer the family. He went and, and deceived the woman. And in deceiving her, uh, she sinned before God and then she gave of the, of the tree, the fruit of the tree she wasn't supposed to eat of, and the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and she ate of that tree. Then she gave to her husband with her. He ate with her, and now they're both in sin. They're both wrong. They're both in sin for what they have done. And we find that Satan then uh, tempts Cain, and through Cain's jealousy, through Cain's anger and rage, he ends up killing his brother Abel. And we, we just continue to read from there all the, the terrible things that happen in, in the lives of folks, in the families of people. And he has consistently tried to break down the family structure, the family environment. He is trying to break it down, and he has been very successful at it, I'm sorry to say. When we look into the Bible, we see that, that God had never intended for that to happen. In the book of Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, Jesus would be speaking at this time to the Pharisees and, and those folks who had asked him if it's lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause. Matthew 19, 3. In verse 4 he said, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Wherefore there are no more twain, two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Matthew 19, verse 4 through 6. And so here, whatever God has joined together, let not a man put asunder. Let not a man separate. Don't let him break those things apart, but let's keep those things together. But as we've noted, Satan continues to do his work. Satan continues to, to provide this onslaught against the family against society, and certainly uh, the breakdown of the home uh, results in a breakdown of our cities, of our communities, of our states, and our nation, and all. That's what happens. And so when we think about the home, the home as described in Scripture has been under attack, and it continues to be under attack, and sadly, we fall for it, and we push Christ out. And that's where the problem comes in. That's certainly a very bad situation. As we look today, of course, we can look around in our own country and see how that, that the home is under attack because divorce is so prevalent. 
We're divorced where people are trying to tear apart what God said, leave together. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder or separate. Don't let a man separate what God joins together. Now, in Matthew 19, verse 6, but what man wants to do is, we say, well, we're going to go ahead and tear it apart anyways. I know you said don't do it, but we're going to do it anyway. We're going to tear it apart. We're going to destroy what you wanted us to do. And this is the result, Matthew 19. And there, verse 6, what God has said, and then we just deny it. We don't do it anymore. You look around today, and we see the home being under attack by the children being born out of wedlock. That's another problem. Whenever you look into Scripture, what we find is Hebrews and chapter uh, 13 talks about this in verse number 4. He says there that marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but adulterers and whoremongers God will judge. The Bible says that the marriage bed is that which is undefiled. We find over and over again that within the relationship of marriage, that is when children are legitimately brought into this world. But sadly, we have a, a society, we have a time in which uh, children born out of wedlock is almost the norm, and it's a terrible, terrible thing. And I don't blame the children. The children are not at fault. These children are born. They, they didn't get a choice in the matter. But I do blame the parents. I do blame the parents because they did not uh, listen to God. They didn't uh, accept or follow what the Lord said regarding such things as purity, marital purity. They did not listen to the Lord. They did not keep themselves and keep their bodies uh, to themselves in that sense. But rather, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, they committed a sin by, uh, not only against God, but a sin against their own bodies as well. And from that sin, then we have these children born out of wedlock. And they don't know their father or they don't know, you know, some whatever side of the family and so on and so forth. They don't know anything about it. Or from this also comes the uh, scourge called abortion, called the murder of a baby. Because these two people that weren't married, these two people that uh, had no real relationship at all, and they just met one another, whatever it might be. It might be a one-night fling. It might be whatever, boyfriend, girlfriend, quote-unquote, whatever the thing may be. But they're not uh, married, and they're not in that situation, a relationship they need to be. And invariably, somebody gets scared, worried, whatever, and they'll end up killing that child. Again, the child is not at fault at all. The child has done nothing wrong. The child is not uh, the one to f at fault or the one to blame. And yet you'll have folks who will go ahead and kill that child. Well, whenever you did that, you just committed murder. And that's what it is. And, and I know that's blunt language, but folks, we've got to face facts. We've got to face facts. We've got to understand just what this is. Whenever there's a human life inside a mother and that human life is viable and, and all of that and, and living and so forth, and then you decide to end its life, that is a murder. Now, folks, this is what the devil does to us. This is what the devil has, has um, pushed on us. And he tempts us, he scares us, he fills us with regrets and sadness and sorrow. Yes, I recognize that was a sin. We just said it was a sin whenever you uh, are committing sexual acts and you're not married to one another. Yes, that's a sin. But at the same time, you can repent of that sin, you can come out of that sin, and you can be right before God if you so choose. But what Satan does is Satan wants us to think, oh, this is, this is it, this is the end of the world, just something so terrible you can never be forgiven. Or the other side of the coin, Satan wants us to say, oh, this is not the right time. And you'll have these folks saying it's not the right time, it's not the right situation, and I know that, and so I'll just go ahead and kill this child because I'm not ready for a child. Well, if you're not ready for a child, you shouldn't have done the things necessary to bring a child into the world. But that being the case, this is what the devil does to us. And he tempts us through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 1 John 2, verse 16. And through these temptations and through this lust and so forth will, and again, results in this child. Now, what are we going to do about it? Again, whenever somebody takes and kills that child, they have just committed murder. And that includes the doctors and that includes nurses and whoever else was a party to this situation and tries to justify it. That's a fact. 
somebody says, well, but, it, it, you know, it's her body and it's her this and that. Well, you know what? The, a baby is not a female body part. And maybe we forget that sometimes. But, but a baby in the womb is not a female body part. So we cannot say, well, it's her body and it's her decision. It's not her body. There's another body in there. And by the way, what if the child she is carrying is a girl? Does that girl, does that baby girl, does that female, does she not get a choice? I mean, it's her body too, right? Think about that. What has happened is we have refused Christ in the home. What has happened is we have refused to let, let him in, to listen to what the Lord has to say, to what the Lord has revealed. We're not doing that anymore. And this is the result. We have folks today who are uh, just shacking up with each other. And they say, I don't need a piece of paper. I don't need this. I don't need that. And I don't need to, we don't need to be married. We can just be shacked up in playhouse. Well, the Bible says we need to be married. And the Bible emphasizes that point. From Genesis 2 all the way through the Bible, all the way into Matthew 19, we just read a moment ago. Romans chapter 7 talks about folks being married, and then if a spouse is dead, the, the wife could marry someone else. Because the husband's dead, she could marry somebody else, and so on and so forth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, there in about the first five verses, talks about how that when uh, two people are married, the, bo the, the woman's body belongs to the husband, the husband's body belongs to the wife. And that being said, so they understand it is within that relationship that, uh, well, that relationship is where they are one, where they're united physically, where they're united emotionally, where they're not united in action, united in work, united in, in thoughts and words and deeds. It's not, it does not happen just because you got a boyfriend or girlfriend. It doesn't just happen just because you shacked up sometime. It doesn't happen just because you will it to be so. Uh, it's not that. It is when folks are married to one another. Child abuse. Child abuse is a big problem today, isn't it? And people are abused mentally. They're abused uh, verbally. They're abused sexually and so forth. They're just abused in many ways and oftentimes it's, it's, it's child abuse. In other words, the, the parent toward the child or somebody says, well, it wasn't, wasn't the parent. It was the step parent. It was the, you know, or it was the boyfriend or whatever. And so uh, there again, you see how the home broke down? What happened to the original father and mother? What happened to them? What happened to that? And so here we find so many times where Christ has been pushed out, he's been pushed away, and here we are suffering the consequences. Folks will suffer those consequences all the way through. And, of course, we look into, on, on television, and what does television do? The television, movies, and various media, what do they do? Well, it's a constant attack on the home, a constant attack. And whether it's... Uh, through homosexuality, whether it is cohabitation or shacking up, just being presented as normal, that's just the normal thing everybody does, whether it's lewd conduct, alcoholism, and other things uh, being portrayed as normal, as okay. And oftentimes when you have a television program that has two parents, a father, mother, and, and then the children, and you have the two parents in the family, how many times do you find that that uh, television program, movies, whatever, portrays those parents as, as dopes, portrays them as idiots, and here the children have to raise themselves. Well, I'm not saying there's not people that's idiots, and I'm not saying there's not people that don't yeah, that, that lack sense a lot of times, but I'm telling you that kind of thing just exacerbates a problem. It just glorifies a problem rather than trying to fix it. And so we need to understand this cycle will continue so long as we keep pushing Christ out. We need to have Christ in our homes. He needs to be there. He needs to be a part of it. And what impresses me as I read my Bible is that there were times when Christ was literally with people. He was literally in people's homes. If, for example, in the book of Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, if you want to read with me, Mark chapter 1, 29 through 31, tells us about a time when Jesus was in Simon and Andrew's home. Jesus went to Simon and Andrew's home, the Bible says, and when he did, he said, 
he came in there and Simon's wife's mother, Simon Peter, his mother-in-law, lay sick of the fever, it says. And so they told him about it. And verse 31 says that Simon, or says uh, he came, Jesus did, came and touched her by the hand. And when he touched her by the hand, he says, and she, uh, he lifted her up and immediately the fever left her and she ministered or served them. And so here Jesus is and he comes into the house and, and Peter's mother-in-law, she's very, very sick, has a, has a distressing fever, has a problem like that, that's very bad. She's obviously very sick. And what does Jesus do? He comes in and he heals her, takes her by the hand. He heals her. The fever is gone. She is better now. Jesus was invited into their home. You'll see this again in Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, verse 22, down through verse number 43. And that's a lot to read, but uh, Matthew 5, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 5, verse 22 to verse 43, that's where Jesus goes into the home of Jairus. Jairus, uh, here the Bible says, he was one of the rulers of the synagogue and he had a daughter. The daughter at this time was very, very sick. So he goes to Jesus and, and begs him to come back. Come back with me uh, because my child's so sick. And Jesus gets there. And you read this chapter and you'll see what, what all happened because there's different obstacles that happened to Jesus. But he finally gets to the house. And whenever he gets there, the people in the house say, listen, don't bother him anymore. She's dead. She's dead. So his concern over his daughter, obviously he was trying to get Jesus to come with him at the time. And in the meantime, she's died. That's when Jesus goes in, the Bible says, and he goes in and goes to the, to the room where she was. And he took her by the hand and said, Talitha Cumai. That's an Aramaic term. And what it meant was, damsel or daughter, I say to thee, arise. And those who know about this language say that this would have been a, a greeting. This would have been something that you'd have said, you know, your fa you're the father and your daughter is asleep and you tell her, get up. That's kind of what he's saying here. Honey, get up. Honey, wake up. That's the kind of thing he's saying here when he says, damsel, I say to thee, arise. He's saying, honey, get up. He wakes her up. He, she's been dead, but he raises her from the dead. The Bible says she arose and she walked. She's 12 years old and Jesus had healed her. He had brought her back from the dead. Jesus was there, my friends. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 38 down through verse 42, that's when Jesus was in the home of Mary and Martha. And while in the home of Mary and Martha, and Martha was uh, there, uh, had much serving, it says. She was and, and dealing with guests and others, obviously with Jesus and others. But Mary sat there and listened to Jesus teach. It is Martha then who says to Jesus, tell Mary to get up. Tell Mary to help me with the, these things. And Jesus then tells her, he says, Martha, Martha, thou art very careful and cumber about with many things. He says, but one thing thou needest. There's one thing that you need. And he says, Mary is the one who chose it. She chose the good part that will not be taken away from her. She was one who chose, Mary was, one who chose correctly. Jesus has come into the home. He is teaching. He is instructing. And she received that good part. If you're in Luke chapter 10, just jump over to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, the first 10 verses speak about Zacchaeus and how Zacchaeus had climbed up in the sycamore tree. You remember that? So he could see Jesus as Jesus passed through Jericho. And Jesus sees him up in the tree, sees him up there and calls for him to come down. Come down out of that tree. And he said, today I must stay at your house. Verse 9, Luke 19, 9. I must stay at your house, telling him how salvation has come to him. For the Son of Man, Luke 19, 10, has come to seek and save that which is lost. So Jesus has come here literally to people's homes. What is going to be the result? What do these things mean? What is going to happen? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But let me pause and remind you, this program is brought to you by the Caneyville Church of Christ. Caneyville Church of Christ meets together on the Lord's Day at 10 a.m. for Bible study, 1045 for morning worship, and 5 in the afternoon for worship on the Lord's Day. We meet Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for a period of Bible study. We meet right across the road from the Sacramento Bank. there near the intersection of Highway 62, Highway 79 in Caneyville, Kentucky, and Grayson County. 
We'd love to see you. Love for you to come be with us at any and every time you can. Bring an open Bible. Bring an open mind as we study and learn together from God's Word. Also, we would uh, encourage you to go to our website, CaneyvilleChurchOfChrist.com. Or if you'd like, you can go to uh, our Facebook page, look up Caneyville Church of Christ on Facebook, like us, follow us. There's all kinds of things you can read and study and, and things we have on our website and things we put on the Facebook page. And, and hopefully these things will help you, will encourage you uh, as you study and as you learn from the book of God. And of course, you can contact us, you can send us emails or send us messages and things and whatever you'd like. If you'd like to, uh, uh, well, if you'd like to uh, set up a Bible correspondence course, or if you would like to set up just a home Bible study together, and us sit down and talk about God's Word together, just call me, 589-4167. We'll talk about God's Word. You can text me or you can call me. We'll set up a Bible study, or we can send you a Bible correspondence course. It's absolutely free. We would love to do that. We would love to set that up. And love to uh, talk to you about these things of spiritual nature. And so if you want to talk about Bible things, you want to talk about the truth, you want to talk about God's Word, you want to set up a Bible study, a correspondence course, or any of these other things, you just call me, 589-4167. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to talk to you about these things. So we're talking about the home. We're talking about Christ in the home. We're talking about what it means. Here we've noted no less than four places. Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 5, Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 19. And we could use other examples, but there are four examples right there where Jesus literally went to people's homes. He literally was in their houses, and you'll notice that every time, in every case, in every place where Jesus went into the house, number one, he was welcomed into each home. He did not take a battering ram and, you know, knock the door down. He did not uh, somehow force his way in, but he was welcomed into that home. Number two, when he goes into that home, there was a real need that existed in every one of those homes, wasn't there? Now, it may have been a physical illness. It may have been a spiritual problem. Whatever it was, there was a real need that existed in that home when Jesus went in there. Number three, we notice that Jesus brought blessings into each one of those homes. And to each one of those homes, he, he blessed them. And so number four, the fourth point is this, that in every case, every case, Jesus left that home better than when he got there. When he entered into the, into the home of Peter and his wife, the mother-in-law was sick. When he left, she was well. When he entered the home of Jairus, the daughter was dead. When he left, she was alive. When he went into the house of Mary and Martha and went there, uh, there was ignorance and there was uh, confusion and there was focus in the wrong direction. Whenever he left, then people were corrected. In the case of Zacchaeus and his house, whenever he went in there, there was lost people. He said, I've come to seek and save the lost. And here was a man who needed salvation. Here's a man who needed forgiveness. And whenever Jesus went into that house, he needed it. By the time Jesus left that house, he had received his forgiveness. He had received that salvation. He received the thing that he needed. And I'm going to tell you something. That's exactly the way that it is today. Whenever I invite Christ into my home, when I invite him into my life, the blessings are abundant. The blessings are true. The blessings are real. And we find Jesus here who will come. He will, leave, he will make sure that your life is better once he gets there. There will be blessings that come as a result of Jesus Christ being in the home. Now, does that mean everyone's going to like it and everybody's going to be happy all the time? No. Doesn't mean everybody's going to like it that I've invited Christ into my home. If you go back to Mark chapter 5, when Jairus invites Jesus into the home, you remember the, the people that were there mourning and crying? And the Bible says that they, they told him, said, don't bother the master with this. She's already dead. But Jesus went on in and Jesus said, she is just sleeping. Instead of these people paying attention to that. Instead of these people thinking and, and really considering what Jesus had said, what they did was laugh at him. The Bible says that they were crying and then they laughed him to scorn. They laughed at him. They made fun of him. You know, as, as if he doesn't know what's going on and this idiot's come in here thinking that a dead girl's just asleep. What's wrong with him? He doesn't know the difference between death and sleeping. And laughed at him and made fun. And, of course, they were the ones that were shown, finally, that, that they were the ones in the wrong, and Jesus was correct. 
But all that being the case, please understand, all that being said makes this point. And that is that just because whenever Jesus is invited into our home, it doesn't mean everybody's going to like it. Doesn't mean everybody's going to be happy with you. Doesn't mean everybody's going to going to agree with you. But I'm going to tell you this, folks: when we do what the Lord says and we allow the Lord to lead us through His Word, we're going to be the blessed people as a result, regardless of what anyone else says. We're going to be the blessed people. We're going to have this regardless of what people think they like, they don't like. In First Peter chapter four and verse four, he talks about some Christians who had turned from the worldly ways. And they turned to live for the Lord. And Peter talks about the fact that wherefore they, that is the people of the world, wherefore they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you. That's what he says in that case. They, they thought it strange that you didn't run with them to the same excess of riot. And what a terrible thing that is. What a horrible situation that is. And when we, and it's another way that Satan will work on you. It's another way that Satan will tempt you to be unfaithful to God, to turn your back on God. He will tempt you to, to walk away from him and not want to be a Christian and not want to serve him. He will tempt you in this way because we look around and say, well, my friends don't agree and my friends don't like what I'm doing and they don't, you know, they make fun of me or they laugh at me or they call me names or they, they talk about me behind my back or, or I've, I've, we used to be real close. We used to be real close and now we're not close anymore. And so that upsets folks. We need to realize that's the devil at work. In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, it says that he, like a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, and he's trying to devour you. He's trying to hurt you. We need Christ in the home. We need him as the unseen guest at every meal. We need him in our lives. We need to pay close attention to what the Lord has said and what the Lord has revealed. I need to spend time in God's book. That's what I need. I need to take God's word. I need to read it. I need to study it. I need to learn it. I need to follow it and be obedient. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 tells us that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. He is the author of that eternal salvation, and I need to appreciate that. I need to understand just what it is to be a child of God. I need to come to the Lord believing that he is the Son of God, to repent of my sins, to confess my faith in him and be baptized for the remission of my sins. And when I do that, I'm following the Lord's plan of salvation, the plan of salvation that he laid out, the plan of salvation that was taught all through the book of Acts, and that which saves man. And then to be faithful to the Lord all the days of my life, be faithful in following him and serving God at all times. That's what it takes. He needs to be in my home. He needs to be in my life. Not just once in a while, not just whenever I feel like it, not just whenever the mood strikes or whenever I don't have anything else better to do, but every day. And when I do that, I'm, my life will be better. My life, there will be purpose, there will be meaning, there will be truth. When I do what the Lord says, I don't have any regrets. You know, that's the thing about it. Whenever I do what I want to do, I generally end up regretting it. Whenever I do what I want to do and I give in to my own desires and my own whims and my own sins and my own thoughts, I generally end up regretting it. But whenever I do what the Lord says, I never regret it. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says that my labor is not in vain in the Lord. Vain means worthless, without profit, no use. It's a waste of time. And in the Lord, it is not a waste of time. In the Lord, that's where I, found, I find true meaning, true purpose. And I need to appreciate that. And I hope you will as well. Think seriously about these things. And I hope that this little uh, study today will help you and will encourage you to put Christ in the home. If he's not in your home already, let's get him in your home by following his plan of salvation, living faithfully to him. If he's been in your home and you've, you've rejected him, bring him back in. Repent of what you've done. Bring him back into your home and live the kind of life that God wants you to live and serve him all the days of your life. And again, if I can help you with that, if we can study together and talk about that, let me know. Call me, 589-4167. Love to talk to you. Love to study with you. Look us up on, on CaneyvilleChurchOfChrist.com or the Facebook page or any of those other things. We're so thankful for this time and so thankful for our study together. Till next time, Lord willing, we bid you good day.